I'm proud to introduce our next speaker. It's Congressman Seth Moulton, a Democrat representing Massachusetts 6th Congressional District, a Marine Corps veteran who served four infantry combat tours in Iraq. Seth currently sits on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, where he's ranking member of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, and the newly formed House Select Committee on the Strategic Competition between the U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party. He was named the most effective freshman Democrat in his first term, and no House or Senate office has won more democracy awards from the Congressional Management Foundation than his team. Congressman Moulton co-authored the bill to de designate 988 as the National Suicide and Mental Health Lifeline with a veteran across the aisle. Since going live nationwide in July 2022, the hotline has saved a record number of lives. He's a national leader on mental health, national security, veterans, and high-speed rail. Please welcome Representative Moulton. It's an honor to be here, um, most of all because members of Congress are not particularly highly regarded these days. But when I walked in, a school group uh, started whispering, is that a real spy? <laughs> it's about the best compliment I've gotten in a while. Ray, thank you very much for the introduction. You know, I was speaking to uh, a, a defense company in my district not too long ago that actually made some of the weapon sites that we use in the infantry uh, in Iraq, some of the very sophisticated, expensive weapon sites uh, that allow you to see you know, thermal imagery and whatnot. I had no idea that these were made right at home, uh, close to where I grew up. And after touring the company and trying some of their new devices, uh, they brought all the employees in on the factory floor uh, so that I could tell them how important they are to our national security and how proud I am that they're doing advanced manufacturing right here in Massachusetts. And then I opened it to questions, as I will with all of you shortly. And I said, please, don't hesitate to ask any questions. But it was utter silence. I said, no, really, my job is to take tough questions. You can ask whatever you'd like. And then finally, a woman in the very back raised her hand, and she said, who are you? <laughs> so it's really nice to get an introduction. Ray, thank you. My impression is that, I, we, we just got out of votes, but my impression is that uh, you've heard a lot about some of the uh, practical things that we need to do to address uh, force posture around, around the world, specifically in the Indo-Pacific. I, I would like to try to talk at a little bit more strategic level as we think about the big picture challenges facing the United States, but specifically with regards to China. So let me just start here. If Xi Jinping decides to invade Taiwan, something that he has stated quite clearly he wants to do, that he intends to do, that's important for his legacy, the same sort of words that we heard from Vladimir Putin and a lot of people discounted, disregarded, ignored. He's not really going to do that. I can't tell you how many people, including a lot of people, Ukrainians and Americans in Ukraine, told me that within months of the invasion. But if Xi Jinping actually decides to do this, as he said he would, America only has two options, and they're both terrible. The first is that we say, oh, no, we're kidding. We're not going to do anything. And that might sound convenient to a lot of people who don't want to see America involved in another war. But I think it's easy to underestimate the massive economic consequences to seeding advanced chip production to our biggest rival, to giving them control over all the trade through that part of the world, and more importantly, to sending a message to every ally and adversary around the world that America's promise doesn't matter, because that will undermine American deterrence the world over. We could literally see more lives lost over time to failing to stand up to Taiwan for, for Taiwan than if we do. Now, of course, the second option, the second of two options, if Xi Jinping invades Taiwan, is that we go to war. And if we do that, I can tell you this morning, I am confident 
we will win. But it will come at an enormous cost. We're talking Vietnam War level casualties in the space of a few weeks. Waking up tomorrow with two US aircraft carriers at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean with thousands of young Americans. So given that those are the only two options, if the PLA invades Taiwan, it means that we must succeed at deterrence. We must succeed. And for everything that's gone right for us in Ukraine, I mean, remember that pretty much every military analyst the world over predicted that Ukraine would fall in a matter of weeks. And here they are today still hanging on to their sovereignty. For everything that's gone right there, we have to admit that deterrence failed. So sitting on the China Committee and on the Armed Services Committee in Congress, we think a lot about what we need to do to succeed in deterrence. Now, of course, naturally, the first place we start is military deterrence. I'm sure that's what we're talking about here today. But it's important to remember that the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, talks about deterrence in four realms, military, but also economic, informational, and diplomatic. I'm not going to go into the other three today. We'll focus on, on military deterrence. But it's, used, it's worth mentioning that there's a lot of alignment on the committee around what we need to do diplomatically and in the information space. There's a tremendous amount of debate about what we need to do economically for deterrence. It's a very interesting topic, but I won't go in it, into it today. But even just speaking about military deterrence, where I think there's a lot of agreement on what we need to do, even though we all recognize that we're behind, deterrence is all about what the other guy thinks, right? It's not good enough just to have Seth Moulton up here and say, we're going to win this war. We need to understand what might actually cause the Chinese, but specifically Xi Jinping, since he really runs the show there, to go to war. So it's a very real challenge that we have just simply getting into Xi's head. Now, the most recent interaction we've had with Xi, of course, is when uh, the bilateral meeting with, uh, with the president. But even coming out of that meeting, it's tough to know what she is thinking. There were no formal note takers in that meeting, so it's a classic case of he said, she said. Oh, come on. When Stephen Colbert said that, he got a, he got a, a great laugh from his, from his paid audience. I guess that's why he makes the big bucks. But the point is that it's what the enemy thinks that matters most. One of the interesting challenges with this is that part of the reason I'm, com I'm confident we would win a war is because we have some highly classified, remarkably exquisite capabilities that would do a lot of damage to the Chinese. Of course, if they're highly classified and they don't know about them, that works well for winning a war. It doesn't work very well for deterrence. So this is one of the challenges that we have with figuring out how we not just win a war in the Pacific, but fundamentally we deter one from ever happening since that must be the goal. Now, as we try to get into Xi Jinping's head and think about how he would decide whether or not to go to war, one of the things that comes to mind for me as uh, someone who made it to the remarkable rank of captain in the, in the armed services, that would be impressive if I was in the Navy, but I was only in the Marine Corps is a question that we always got in our lieutenant strategy classes, which is, what is our critical vulnerability? Or more specifically, what does Xi Jinping think our critical vulnerability is? Because that's going to have a lot to do with his decision making as to whether we go to war. We're not at the question period yet, but I'm just curious, what do people think, quite briefly, is our critical vulnerability? Public sentiment. Political will. What do other people think? What's the supply chain? Infrastructure. Security of existing shipyards. Industrial capacity. This whole thing doesn't work very well when the first guy has the right answer, in my opinion. Usually it takes a long time to get to that. But I think what Xi Jinping believes our critical vulnerability 
is the will of the American people to go to war. And that's challenging because there are a lot of American people who tell me, oh, come on, Seth, we don't really need to go to war over Taiwan, which, of course, is a very dangerous message for deterrence. So if we can acknowledge that that is a serious vulnerability, or at least a critical vulnerability likely in the eyes of our enemy, then I think it's important to think about our force structure, a force structure that should be fundamentally designed, once again, to deter conflict. I think it's important to keep that critical vulnerability in mind as we design our force structure. So what does this mean? It means, one, we need to get a lot of weapons in the hands of our allies. Because if Taiwan gets invaded and they have a lot of our stuff, they don't need to get American public sentiment on their side to counter the Chinese. That's very important. Number two, we grew up reading about World War II, uh, sorry, World War I, and the danger of entangling alliances, the entangling alliances in Europe that led to the outbreak of World War I. But I think when it comes to deterrence, entangling alliances are actually very helpful. It's helpful for us that Xi Jinping can look out and see a whole bunch of allies in the Pacific and know, much like Putin sees or Putin knows when he looks out at Europe, that you attack any one of these and they're likely all to go to war against us. So the work to build up, the diplomatic work, and also the economic work, by the way, to build up our allied partnerships in the Pacific is critically important when it comes to deterrence. I also think, because of this potential critical vulnerability, that it's very important to have fewer personnel-dependent platforms whose use depends on politically motivated decisions. What do I mean by that? If we're worried about the American public's will to go to war, then we don't want to have to make the case to the American public it's going to take a lot of troops to win this war. And we don't want to get to the point where we know we have to make a lot of political decisions about engaging those troops in order to fight and win. Luckily, we live in an age where we can do something about this problem. So a few examples of what I mean by this. I think the Marine Corps' concept of stand-in forces is good. Why? Because they're already there. We don't have to make a decision to deploy the Marine Corps from Camp Pendleton or Camp Lejeune over to the Pacific if Xi Jinping starts an invasion. The Marines are there. They're in relatively small numbers. They're ready to fight. And we all know that they will shoot back if they are attacked. So stand-in forces are good. Large aircraft carriers, I think, are bad. Sorry, US Navy. But we know that they're vulnerable. We also know that if we see that they're vulnerable, there will be a lot of political pressure to move them back, to move them out of the way. That's not very helpful for a deterrence. Autonomous ships and autonomous planes, good. Because we can send a lot of autonomous ships and planes in towards China and Taiwan and not have to worry about American lives. F-35s the aircraft designed to fight China that can't reach China. Not very useful in this fight, especially if you have to pull back some of our larger assets. Lots of attack subs. We have amazing superiority under the water. But what matters in this scenario is not the boomers. They're critical for our foundational deterrence, of course, and that matters with uh, the rapid rise of uh, China's nuclear arsenal. But fundamentally, we win this fight with attack subs. And while nuclear forces are absolutely necessary, they're not what we want to go to to win this fight. And that means we have to have massive conventional forces deterrence. Part of that is just simply having the magazine depth, the number of missiles on hand to fight and win this battle 
without going dry and saying the only thing we have left are nukes. So a few quick words on how we get there going down by the services, and then I'll be delighted to take your questions. First of all, I understand I'm a little biased, but I do think the Marine Corps with Force Design 2030 is leading the way. They have a strategy, stand-in forces, clearly designed for this fight. They are modernizing rapidly. About eight of us Marine veterans in Congress, House, and Senate uh, wrote an op-ed last year in defense of Force Design 2030, in defense in the face of a lot of critics. But our one criticism of Force Design 2030 is we said the Marine Corps is not moving quite fast enough. They're divesting of things they don't need. You're not going to win this fight with tanks. Tanks have no use in defending a bunch of islands against the, the Chinese. But you are going to win it with a lot of drones, missiles, exactly the kinds of things that the Marine Corps is using its money from divestitures to invest in. They've also set the culture to, fact, to change fast, which is important if we're going to keep up with this, th with this threat. Now, the Navy, on the other hand, I think is behind. We can't even agree on a shipbuilding plan. And I would argue that the shipbuilding plan we've seen is terribly outdated. It does not include a lot of autonomous ships. It does not include the kinds of modernization initiatives that we need to meet this fight. And it's heavily dependent still, especially if you look at the actual numbers, on the kinds of big personnel-dependent ships that I would argue are not the most effective deterrent in this scenario. The Army has been designated with some essential capabilities, but it's a little bit hard to look at the Army and not say that they're chasing or searching for relevance in the Pacific. My point is this, the Army is fundamentally a large land force. Again, not something that has a lot of relevance to this fight. So my point is not that we should get rid of the Army, but we should make sure that as we choose our capabilities and investments carefully to meet this challenge of deterrence. We're not just assigning tasks to the Army because they're around and we need to have something for them to do, but we're being very strategic about what forces we need and what forces we don't. For a long time, we derided the fact that the, the, the PLA was this million-man army that was terribly trained and terribly ineffective. But if you look at what China has done, they've dramatically reformed that. And they've taken a lot of money out of their army and put it into other capabilities. The Air Force is absolutely, of course, essential in this fight. But I think we need to bring this lens of deterrence again to how we're investing in the Air Force and make sure that the capabilities really match the threat. And finally, on the Space Force, I will say that five years ago, I, I'm the ranking Democrat on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee on the House Armed Services Committee. So that means I'm the senior Democrat in the House in charge of our Space Force. And I'll tell you that five years ago, I was very concerned about the pace of China in weaponizing space compared to our own. I think the Space Force has made a remarkable turnaround. They're not perfect. But their pace of change, literally the pace at which we are getting new capabilities up into space, is pretty impressive. So I think that they are on track. I'll conclude with four big picture strategic questions that we need to think about in the context of this whole challenge of deterrence. Number one, we've never had three peer nuclear adversaries before. There's been a remarkable dearth of simple intellectual thinking, philosophy, on how to deal with this. It's time for more 1950s era thinking about what deterring two near-peer nuclear adversaries looks like. Integrated deterrence. It's a great concept. It could help us answer that first question I posed. But we've got to make sure it's believable. The China Committee went up to New York recently and did an interesting economic war game where we looked at using some of the levers of our economy as deterrence, and one of the challenges is that there are certain levers that would be so devastating not just to China but to us that they're not necessarily believable. In other words, the Chinese just might not believe that we would actually use them. And of course, if they're effective deterrence, we have to use them in advance of conflict, not just in response. 
The third point I'd make is that our current basic philosophy with winning this deterrence fight in the Pacific is, as we often say, to make sure that every day that Xi Jinping wakes up for the rest of his life, he says, this is not the day. I don't like that philosophy because, of course, it means that any one day it can go wrong and it doesn't work. So I think we need to devote more intellectual work to perhaps a better strategy than just that, but specifically, what are some of the off-ramps here? We didn't talk about that enough with Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. And finally, a question that I often pose uh, in, our, in our hearings on the China Committee, um, Mr. Whitman knows he hears this from me a lot, it might sound like a broken record, is what kind of relationship do we want to have with China 20 or 30 years from now? I think that's a very hard question to answer. But I think it's also hard to have a really co co cogent strategy for deterrence if we don't know where we're going, if we don't know where we want to be. It's another place where there's a lot of debate, but a lot of work needs to be done. So that concludes my, my comments. Um, I hope this is helpful taking it to a slightly different level than maybe we've been discussing so far. And I would be delighted to hear your questions, especially your critical questions, uh, challenging what I've said. Okay. Moderate your Q and A. All right. Uh, before we get to the Q and A, I think a lot of our, uh, our audience would uh, would agree that uh, it might not be the most the highest rank, but O3 in either Marine Corps captain or or, or uh, Navy lieutenant is the best rank uh, for for officers in the I, Navy. I have often said that that's what I want on my headstone <laughs> someday. Hopefully not too soon. Uh, captain USMC. There you go, uh, Mike. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think a really critical question we should be asking ourselves is, what is Xi Jinping's critical vulnerability, mm -hmm. and what can we do to impact that vulnerability and strengthen our deterrence, both conventionally and from a nuclear point of view? I think it's an incredibly important question. Uh, it makes me feel a little bit guilty for not getting to it. I thought about talking about that. Uh, but but um, I would love to hear, just sort of just like we did at the beginning, Quick thoughts on what you think Xi Jinping's critical vulnerability is. Domestic audience. Domestic audience. Economy. Party. Sorry? Party. 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 Birth rate. Birth rate, economy. We have this scenario again where I, my personal view is that the first answer is the right answer, which is that he is very concerned about domestic political support. So what does that mean in terms of what are, how, how can we take advantage of that? I think this is a place where we need to have a much more robust information operations deterrent. To say to Xi Jinping, we can change the minds of a lot of people in your country if we decide we want to. Other countries have been quite adept at doing that. I mean, we all know that Russia has tried to interfere with our elections, for example. We know how to do this. We don't have a real serious, robust effort to do so, and importantly, it's not about actually doing it today, but demonstrating that we have that capability. Because I think that if we could really target that and show Xi Jinping that you start this war, you're gonna quickly lose domestic support, it could be a powerful deterrent. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that's exactly where I intended to go. Uh, you mentioned uh, our psychology of deterrence. Uh, what I think is most important to that is getting inside Xi Jinping's head, and that's pretty easy because he is uh, very vocal about what he wants. He wants to control the island of Taiwan. He knows that in order to co control the island of Taiwan, he has to put a full army, uh, you know, in hundreds of thousands or uh, up to a million uh, armed uh, uh, ground troops on the island in order to control it. Uh, and uh, to do that, he has to move them through his greatest asset, which is his uh, control of the South China Sea, or the China Sea generally, including the Straits, of course. Uh, the thing is that None of that works. Uh, uh, 
and it does not seem to me all that much of a reach uh, to, for him uh, to come to understand that. And the real deterrence that he needs is not global shipping capacity, not uh, able to uh, fight uh, carriers uh, in the Atlantic Ocean or something. So you have a question? Uh, it's to effectively move amphibious vehicles with vast numbers of troops through the uh, Taiwan Straits and other places with invulnerability. We have tremendous capacity uh, so, to so make so that to take that option away from him. Yeah. Just make him know it. So, sir, let me just address that briefly, and um, so we have time for other questions. But I mean, I agree with you in principle, um, and we do have some capabilities to. Yeah, no, that's no, that's a good question. Um, uh, I agree with that in principle. I think there are a lot of capabilities we've demonstrated. I would come back though to some of the things that we have to show. One, it's not good enough to just have those capabilities somewhere in the United States of America or, or in the Pacific if Xi Jinping decides on quick, on short order to to do an invasion we got to get a lot of those capabilities to the Taiwanese, right? And we're way behind on that. Uh, another, another point I would make is that although as a practical matter, that's what he has to do to affect this invasion, it's not where, how a lot of analysts believe the fight might actually start. So uh, for example, if you believe the analyses that say that one of the first things they might do is try to take out some of our satellites to disable our capabilities to use some of the uh, tools that we have for for, uh, for stopping amphibious invasions, for example, then we need to have deterrence in that realm as well. Thank you. Time for one more question. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant morning. Colonel Zabinski. Uh, you mentioned the need to get away from heavily manned ships and then more towards unmanned. With that in mind, could you give us your perspective of the future of the amphibious fleet? Yes, absolutely. So look, I think that the, if you look at the basic idea of Force Design 2030, it's not a huge number of major amphibious ships. You have to have a certain base number, right? But what we've really asked the Navy to provide is smaller ships that can move quickly amongst these islands and shift troops around. And we have a lot of troops that are actually going to be on the ground uh, on these islands. Now, there's a few problems with this as a practical matter, one of which is that we're not really exercising that capability. So I went to the Philippines uh, last year and, um, and, and visited and watched a joint operation between the United States Marine Corps, the Philippine Marine Corps, and the Republic of Korea Marine Corps. On an operational level, it was really impressive how well these uh, three Marine Corps could work together. But then later that night, I met with some Filipino politicians. And I said, you know, the Marine Corps has this concept of stand-in forces. If we bring a few platoons of Marines to hang out in some of your towns, how will they be received? And the answer was not very positive. So the point is that we have to exercise those capabilities. And, and practice not just having assault on the beach, like I witnessed that morning, but actually using these stand-in forces, getting them used to being amongst the community, and showing that this is a capability that is, is not just a nice idea, but something that we practice every day. Thank you, sir. OK. Congressman Moulton, uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like you to have this Naval Institute Press book entitled U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century uh, by uh, Brent Sadler. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank